lived in the 1800s. He was a Chicago businessman and he did really well. And the Chicago fire wiped him out. But before that, there was an early stock market crash, wiped him out. He got his stuff back. Then the Chicago fire wiped him out. And he realized that Chicago wasn't a place, so he had an opportunity in London. And he, he worked out some deals in London. And he sent his wife and his kids ahead to London. He was coming two weeks later. Well, halfway across the Atlantic, the ship sank. He got a telegram from his wife. Everybody died. All his kids died but his wife. The telegram was, I alone am left. And he, he, I mean, it crushed him. But anyway, he went to join his wife in England. And when he got near the spot, the captain had told him, he said, you know, this is about where, and he had sat down and wrote the song, no matter what happens, it is well with my soul. In other words, he believed in God's providence and sovereignty, and he didn't understand it, but he said, whether, whether things were great or whether things were bad, it is well with my soul. It's a great song. It's my favorite song, probably. I tell you what, if y'all never heard it, you ought to listen to the Gospel Plowboys version. It's, man, it's a good one, real good one. You guys going? Oh, okay. Y'all turn to, uh, Luke, back to Luke 6. You know, I tell you what, go to 1 Corinthians 13. Y'all know what we're talking about. I want to read something to you. Now, we're talking about judge not lest you be judged. And we've said this doesn't mean that we're never to uh, exercise discernment. We, we are called to make certain judgments at certain times. But we're not called to be judgmental. Um, we're not called, again, to be uh, scrutinizing and looking and investigating. That's not the, uh, the attitude we ought to have at all. Now, in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, the Lord says, or Paul says, the Lord says through him, Charity, or love, suffereth long, is kind, charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Can y'all see the attitude we ought to have? Rejoiceth not in iniquity. It doesn't love dealing with things like that. It hates it. But rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Now, believeth all things does not mean be naive. It's, it's not what it's saying. In other words, what does love do? It assumes the best. Y'all know something about our nature. We all hate to be lied to because we feel like they think we're a fool. Isn't that how it feels? Somebody lies to you and you think, well, they think I'm stupid. They're pulling the wool over my eyes. But the attitude is then that we're always trying to say what someone's motive is. Y'all know what I mean. Yeah. Oh, he said this, but I know what he meant. And what we're really doing is we're claiming we can see the heart. Only God can see the heart. But even in our courts of law, look, we've got uh, this same thing in our courts of law. For instance, Give the benefit of the doubt, right? Uh, assume the best case scenario. In a worldly court, we say innocent till proven guilty, don't we? We also say make sure it's beyond a preponderance of evidence or with a preponderance of evidence. Uh, what's the other one we say? Beyond reasonable doubt. And when we're dealing with our brothers and sisters in Christ, don't start by assuming the worst. A start, always start, assume the best. Does that make sense? If you start with that attitude, no matter what it is, it'll be a whole lot easier to deal with. But when you start with that scrutinizing negative attitude, what good's going to happen? Nothing. No good will come of it. Now, we all understand what it means to give the benefit of the doubt because we all do it to ourselves all the time. We all give ourselves the greatest benefit of the doubt. Y'all know so-and-so did it. It's the end of the world. I did it, which you don't understand. I, you know, y'all know how we do. We mitigate and we lessen and we explain. We justify it. We'll treat your brothers and sisters essentially like you want to be treated because all that he's working out in Luke is really just one example after another of what we call the golden rule, isn't it? And this is all he's doing. Now, um, you know, in our court system, when it, was, when it was made up, the essential thing that they said was, was, the, the founding fathers that handled the judicial side said it would be better for a thousand men, guilty men, to go free than for one innocent man to go to jail. And so they set it up to give the best benefit of the doubt. Now, that's not how it operates anymore. But anyway, that's what it was meant. 
So, don't reach unjust conclusions about another man's motive. We don't know everybody's motive. We might think we do, but we don't. Have you all ever noticed men and women I have found when a husband and wife are having trouble, usually one of them is, knows the other's motive. Y'all ever, you, she said such and such, but what she meant was, stop now, how do you know what she meant, right? But we all think we can do that sort of thing. We can't. Alright, now, what about the less you be judged? He says, judge not, less you be judged. Does this mean that if I don't judge other people, then God won't judge me and I can go to heaven? No, that's salvation by works, isn't it? What it means is people who judge harshly are then harshly judged. Y'all know when you got somebody that's harsh and they make a mistake, what do we all say? Aha! Right? Well, it's the same with the Lord. Look, the Lord will make sure if you and I deal with others this way, we'll be dealt with this way. And you say, yeah, but can God do that? Or is He God? I mean, come on. Y'all go back to Luke 6 and notice the promise He made. What we're talking about here is the difference between a condemning spirit and a forgiving spirit. Okay? Now, we've got a condemning spirit is looking to do what? Condemn. Okay? What's a forgiving spirit looking to do? All right. So when we deal with the difference between the forgiving spirit and the, and the condemning spirit, what do we mean by spirit? Remember it said the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword? And it's able to divide asunder between several things, doesn't it? The soul and the spirit. The thoughts and intents of the heart. Behind every thought, there's an intent. You know, we think things, but everything we do, before we do it, we think it, right? But you know, there's something driving our thinking. We have a motive before anything else starts. Does that make sense? Y'all you know, know you watch a little kid. We can usually read a little kid's mind, right? Lexi says, yeah, I know she can. <laughs> but uh, I'm trying to think of any. Okay, I get this several times a week now. Sienna found a set of highlighters. I just said I needed more highlighters. I use highlighters when I'm redoing my notes so I can see what I've already done. And I use them and, and it, they, go, they, they run out of ink. And I said the other day, i got to get more highlighters. Sienna cleaned her room and lo and behold found a big set of highlighters. And she said, hey, you want these? Well, I said, yeah, thank you, right? So now, guess what I get? Three times a day when I'm studying. How's those highlighters working out? Right? Hey, how are the highlighters doing? Now, I can usually tell what the real motive is. Is she really interested in the highlighters? No, that's You got it. Yep. Jana knows. He, what it comes down to is there's something she's wanting and she's figured out how to, how to breach the, the conversation. And so she wants to put me in her guilt. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a thing. But y'all know you deal with a little kid like that. But folks, you can't, you can't, we can't deal with adults like that. We can't read adults' minds. Y'all know how many times I'm wrong about what Lexi's motive is? I mean, really. Yeah, we just, we don't know. And yet we would assume that we can know the motive of other Christians that we don't know as personally. You see, you can't do that. So if we just start out by assuming the best. Now, worldly thinking says, yeah, but I'll be made a fool of. Okay. So what? So what? How are you harmed? You're not. Worldly thinking is, yeah, but you better look out. You've got to protect yourself and all. Well, is that how Christ told us to act? No. Folks, if the person is going to wrong me or get over on me, don't we believe that God can take care of us? So watch the promise He made. He says, uh, verse 37, Luke 6, 37, Judge not, you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Now notice what He's saying. Don't judge. In a, in a judgmental way. Don't nitpick. Don't look for stuff. Then he says, don't condemn. And then he says, forgive. But he takes it one step further in the next verse. Give. Don't just forgive, give. Y'all think about what Christ has done for us. Because here's the key. Christ not only has forgiven me, He then turned around and gave me the gift of eternal life. 
Now, the forgiveness is wonderful. What, what, I mean, how can I... See? I've not only been forgiven, I've been given something. How do we need to deal with our brothers and sisters? The same way. So he says, give and it shall be given. Give what? Anything. anything. Forgiveness. You're, look, give anything, he says. It shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. Now, what he's talking about here, first off, the word bosom is lap. He's talking about, you know, they would wear a loose outer garment. And they had a belt around it, but they had a bunch of extra material that they would sew into it. They didn't have pockets. And when they would go to get something, if you read the book of Ruth, there's a good example. Y'all remember when Ruth went to get to glean in uh, Boaz's field? And Boaz said, hey, fill her up, remember? Mm -hmm. And she held out her, y'all, we've done this. Remember when you're little taking your t-shirt and doing that and filling it up? What he's saying is that that's how they would fill up, but let's put it in modern terms. Let's say you go into the, the fruit stand and you're going to buy corn on the cob, right? There is a way that a man can stack corn on the cob in your bushel to his advantage. Right? Yeah. But what he's saying here is, it'll not, only, not only will I give you to the top, I'll shake it down Get all the air out. I'll press it down. In other words, I will be so fair with you that it'll be running over. Now, y'all know, you get a bag of potato chips today. What do you find out when you open them? You have been robbed, haven't you? They, you know, they keep the prices of stuff the same a lot of times, and you don't notice they drop the size. Have y'all noticed that a giant zero is not giant anymore? A giant zero is two little zeros inside like that. Now, I'm speaking from real good experience, okay? <laughs> but the point being is, you're getting gypped, aren't you? See what he's saying here is, my cup runneth over. How much will the Lord give us? Folks, you can't even imagine. Look, this is how we ought to deal with people. When you're dealing with a brother or sister, you're selling something. He's telling us, have equal weights. You know, we're, we're told in the Bible we're warned about unjust weights. Y'all know what I mean. He, I've told y'all when I was young, my dad taught me a trick. I used to pick up the beer cans from him and his buddies, and I had a beer can smasher. Remember, Gina? And we, I'd save them up till I got a bunch, and we'd go to Hickman's and sell them. But my old man taught me a trick. You get you a bucket of sand, and you take a pinch of sand and put it in every can before you smash it. Now, what is that? Cheating. It's better than cheating. It's stealing. Yeah, yeah you say, ah, it's okay. Well, he's just teaching his kid to steal. And, and I took it up naturally. But the point being is that's unjust weights, isn't it? Yeah. How do we deal with our brothers and sisters in assuming if, if there's something wrong? Deal with them in the best possible light. That's how. Don't, don't be glad to do it. Don't go, I know, not like that at all. And, and again, there's some questions that we can test ourselves or, or when it comes to dealing with this, when we have to, you know, in some way judge. Now, here's some questions. Does my criticism arise out of a love for an offended God? Think about it. Does my criticism, does it come from the fact that I know God would not have a sin and sin is an offense unto Him? I'll give you an example. I hate to hear someone say, Oh, God. Don't y'all hate that? Yeah. Or the worst than that, I hate to hear someone on a TV show, you'll hear it all the time, the only time they will ever use His name, they'll say, Jesus Christ, like it's a curse word, won't they? Yeah. Now, if you know someone doing that, why does that offend you? Because they're talking about our Lord. They're talking about our Lord. Yeah, they are blaspheming our Lord. And it's not that you hate this person. It's that you, you know what you want to say? You want to say, oh, they have no idea what they're saying. They're throwing around a name loosely that is the man that died for their sins. I mean, that's horrible, isn't it? Now next, does my criticism arise out of a concern for the person's good? Think about it. You know, you've got to talk to someone about something. There's an issue now. Are you actually concerned about their good? Or are you concerned about the offense to you? You see what I mean? How often are we really concerned about their good? Look, I'll tell you all that there are times, literally, when I, I, you can be brought to tears about watching how someone you love harm themselves eternally. You know they're doing eternal harm to themselves, and you, you, there's nothing you can do. They won't stop. They won't turn. And when you talk to them about it, what do they do? They get offended and they get mad. 
But ultimately, you're not mad with them. You're not, you love them, and you know this person is costing themselves eternally. It's a hard thing, isn't it? Another question. Am I somehow happy about this? When I have to deal with one of these situations, am I somehow happy about it? Do you all know people that just like controversy? Lots of people thrive on it, don't they? He, me and Lexi know people, she'll show me something on Facebook, say, look at this, and I think, man, and we both have this type of anxiety. We're like, I couldn't function. I mean, I'd have ulcers. My style, I don't know how they function like this, and yet they seek it out. They like it, don't they? Are you a person that likes that sort of thing? Now, that's in the world, but let me ask you this. Can we be a sort of person that likes to see our brother and sister sin? No. Folks, there's something wrong with that, isn't it? It's something wrong with seeing one of someone that we're supposed to love do something that harms them and we somehow are excited about it. If there's any excitement or anticipation about dealing with it. I finally caught it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, you know, whenever you have to, very few times if we had to do it, but whenever you have to actually get the group together to talk about something, I'm going to tell you all something. That is the last thing I want to do. I hate it. I would rather do anything than that if it can possibly resolve itself. And that's why I've been guilty of letting things go on way too long. And that's my fault because I hate the idea of doing it. We want to see things in the best possible light. How? How do we do this? Well, it's very simple. What happened on that cross? He died for me. When I was a good Christian, no. when I was yet without strength, when I was a sinner and his enemy, he died for me. Now, if I think about how much I've been forgiven, then guess what? It's a whole lot easier to forgive you, isn't it? Now, y'all go over to Luke 7 because we've got this. The Lord's going to deal with it very clearly. You know, we won't have time to go there, but while y'all are going, I'm just going to give you an example of how a, a Christian, how a saved person can just can fail at this, okay? Was there a greater Old Testament saint than David? Not that I, I don't know him. If y'all do, I don't. You say, well, Abraham, he might have been equal, but come on, David, the man after God's heart, wrote all those psalms, just loved the Lord, didn't he? Do y'all remember when David, after the whole thing with Bathsheba, had slipped over and it looked like it was gone and out of sight? God sent Nathan the prophet unto David, remember? And he told him the story about the man that had a thousand sheep and his neighbor had one little pet sheep. And he needed to have a meal for a visitor. And instead of taking one of his sheep, he went over and got the neighbor's sheep and killed him and, and fed his And do y'all remember what David rose up and said? That man is to die. He stood up and said, he's got to die. Now, was David using a... a let me put it this way. Was David weighing that person in the same scale he weighed himself in? Yeah. And so, I'm sorry, he was, I mean, think of what he was doing. He was doing what we talked about a while ago. When you do it, it's egregious. When I do it, you just don't understand the circumstances. And Nathan said to him, Thou art the man. David had not only committed adultery, he took a, a man's wife that he loved, and in fact, he took that man's life, didn't he, to save his own reputation. And yet in David's mind, how did that seem? Okay. Yeah, he justified it. And so what Nathan did is Nathan called him on the carpet, didn't he? And what did David say when he was called on the carpet? He repented, folks. It broke him. He, he got so caught up in the sin and in the covering it up. Y'all know how we don't like to be caught. He got so caught up in things that he just got carried away. One sin led to another to another. I bet y'all for nine months he didn't write a psalm. How could you write a psalm in that condition? But I tell y'all what, the day Nathan came to him, he wrote one, didn't he? Psalm 51. He said, I, Lord, have mercy on me. He said, I was, I'm not only a sinner, I was conceived in sin. I am rotten. Lord, oh, he begged the Lord. Uh huh? Wouldn't it be fair, Tyler said, wouldn't it be fair to assume that somebody who is constantly wanting to argue, no matter what they think of their causes, is somebody who's cut off anyway because ego is taking over? Um, yeah, for the most part. You know, generally, if somebody just is looking to argue, I mean, y'all know there are people that like to argue. Y'all, everybody knows that. We call it debate. 
Yeah, they'll call it a debate, but it sounds like an argument to me. Um, you know, it's a bunch of screaming and yelling. I once heard at a Bible conference, right, two preachers screaming and yelling at each other. I mean, at the top of their lungs, foaming at the mouth. And another guy went up and said, hey, y'all need to stop arguing. And they said, we're not arguing. We're having a discussion. Yeah. What did it sound like to the lost world? Yeah. It sounded like an argument, didn't it? You know, both of those men are already, they're already out of place in what they're doing. So, yeah, if someone is of a spirit that they're doing that, then they're already on the wrong foot. Um, when you have to go deal with someone, folks, if you're looking forward to doing it, you're already wrong. Something's wrong. You need to stop and examine yourself. And in the case of David, Nathan came to David and presented him with the facts. David had, had mitigated his sin and lessened it to where, you know, it was just a little, you know, I'm the king, it's okay and whatnot. And when he was presented with the facts, what happened? Now, isn't that how we need to do when we're presented with the facts? You know, there have been times, I, I once had to deal with a lady. And um, I was talking to this lady. She would call me every week and complain about what this this one did and what that one did just sins not not even things they've done her what she saw him do just con this has been years ago but she, deal with this and then, then this one then this one and she called me one time and I said you know something you have come to me about just about everybody in our little group have you ever thought that the problem is you and the problem was her and do you know what she said she said whoa wait a minute I never expected you to come at me like this what do you, who do you think you are now think about it. He's going to say, matter of fact, real quick, y'all go back and look what he says in verse 41, Luke 6, 41. Why beholdest thou the moat? That's a little speck of sawdust. Why beholdest thou the moat that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest not the beam, and that means a floor joist, right? That is in thine own eye. Either how can thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the moat that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye. Think what he's saying. How Y'all make it like a cartoon in your mind. Can y'all imagine you pick up the funny papers and there's a guy with a, with a six by six beam sticking out his eye going over there towards James. <laughs> and I'm looking at James over here saying, hey, let me help you with that sawdust. Y'all see what it, what it is? What he's basically saying is, whatever, I, whatever sin I'm judging in James... My judging James and that attitude is worse. What I'm doing is that beam and what James is doing is that little speck. The thing that they're, like this person would call me, the thing that they were complaining about was nothing compared to their gossiping. Seriously, compared to their hateful attitude. But when you're in that situation, it's like David. David said, that man's got to die. And Nathan said, uh-huh, wait a minute. You want to get the sawdust out of his eye and you got the beam in yours. What's the thing that David needed to stop and do? He needed to stop looking at everybody and look at himself. Now, how do you and I look at ourselves? Folks, Christ died for me died for me. And yet, since Christ died for me, how do I treat those He also died for? Like myself. I need to treat you in the same balance as I treat myself. And y'all know we all are willing to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, aren't we? And so, back over to Luke 7, uh, where he says this. It's, he, he makes an analogy here in Luke 7, and it, I'm thankful he does it. It's right after this. But y'all start in verse 36. He says... One of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. He went into the Pharisee's house, sat down to meet. Behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. Now that just means she was not of the Pharisees. She was just an open, you know, worldly woman. It says, When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an al alabaster box of ointment, she stood at his feet behind him, weeping, began to wash his feet with tears, did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake with Within himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Can y'all see the moat and the beam? Mm -hmm. This man's worried about whatever the sin is of this woman. I don't care what it is. Let's say it's prostitution. It does not say that, but that's what people call her. But let's say it is. What's worse, her prostitution or him murmuring about the Lord? Murmuring about the Lord. He can't see. He's going to fix her problem, and he's got right. Now, Jesus is going to go on in the advice and say, look, the pupil is not greater than the teacher. 
In other words, how could I ever help you with your problem when I've never seen my problem? And he's going to use two words in there about seeing. Y'all remember when Paul a while ago, we read where he said when you got to help someone, restore them? That word restore, is, it's a Greek word, ortho, but it's where we get our word like for an orthopedic. You know, doctor, what, do we, what does an orthopedic doctor do? Bones. bones. He fixes bones. He's saying set it, restore, mend the bone. Think about mending a bone. Someone that's, that's a normal doctor that's not a, you know, a cruel, but a normal doctor will take a person and they've got to set that bone. You know what that doctor knows? It's going to hurt. But they they careful and they say, look, this is going to hurt for just a second. And they hate that it's going to hurt, but they know the long-term good it's going to do. That's how we deal with brothers and sisters, folks. Ain't that how you want to be dealt with? Who in the world wants to go and intentionally hurt someone? We don't want to do that. And so the idea he's given us here about this moat, how could I ever be expert enough to help you with your problem when I've never seen my own problem? Make sense? Now, what is the moat that is in the eye of this person? It's some sin, some something. What's the word? A, a picadillo, some little sin, right? I know someone would say there's no little sin, but in reality, this is something small. But what is the beam in the other person's eye? Pride, self-righteousness. What's worse than that? How in the world? This is why he's going to say, look, when the blind lead the blind. Y'all think of all the things he's doing with the eyes here. If you've got a beam in your eye, guess what? You can't, you can't see. see. I mean, y'all, haven't y'all got something in your eye? Hey, look, I'm working on something and get sawdust in my eye. Y'all know that's it. I mean, y'all know what it hurts. It, it, you can't even open your eye. You're blinded. It waters. That's it. You're done with that eye till you get it out, aren't you? Imagine having a stick in it and you're going to scrutinize someone else. So essentially what he's saying here is this. When the blind lead the blind, they both fall into a pit. Right? Now the pit itself is, is interesting. And we're going to go on with this lady, but I want y'all to think about this. Palestine, Israel was full of pits because they were constantly digging for water. And they wouldn't always find water. So what did you have? You had a bunch of holes all around. So if you're blind, it'd be real easy to fall into one, wouldn't it? He, there's an example. Do y'all remember when Joseph's brothers were going to sell him into slavery? Mm -hmm. They threw him into a pit wherein was no water. You see what that's saying? They're throwing him into a well somebody dug that wasn't, so they, that's it. And if you fall into a well where there's no water, think of the analogy. Imagine a, someone trying to teach you the Bible that had never seen their own sin. Imagine someone trying to help you find the living water when they've never drank of it themselves. I mean, you can't do it. You, if you've got someone... Now, the Pharisees were the teachers, weren't they? Did the Pharisees, were they saved? Did they acknowledge their own sin? Imagine them trying to teach the sinners. I mean, seriously, what's he telling them? If the blind lead the blind, they both fall into the pit. The only place a lost person can lead you is where they're going themselves. They can't help you. So what's got to happen first? You got to get the beam out of your own eye. He said, then you can help a brother with his. Get the stuff out of your eye. In other words, deal with your own lost condition, your own sinful condition, your un own unworthiness, your nothingness. And when you come to see your absolute nothingness, now all of a sudden you'll be in a position where you might be able to help another sinner, aren't you? Until then, guess what? He ain't going to help anybody. And so he goes on with this woman. Now the Pharisees, the guy with the beam in his eye, watch this, verse 40. Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. He saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. That's common sense, isn't it? He says, Thou hast rightly judged. Now he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, I love that. He turns and looks on this woman, and in my mind I can see the loving, compassionate way he's looking at her, and he's speaking to Simon behind him. He says, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. She hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. 
Thou gavest me no kiss. This woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil, thou didst not anoint. This woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins which are many are forgiven. Is she forgiven because she wiped his feet? No. She wiped his feet because she was forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. He said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him begin to say within themselves, Who is this that can forgive of sins also? And he saith unto the woman, Thy fate hath saved thee. Go in peace. Now the woman was a sinner, wasn't she? Did she know she was a sinner? Here's the Pharisee judging her and going to correct her life. And what's his problem? He's got that big beam sticking out of his eye. He has never seen himself lost. You know, you deal with people lots of times and you'll tell them this and some folks don't like to hear it, but you don't get saved before you get lost. You just don't. In other words, there has got to be a time when you know you're lost. You and there has to be days. something that you need to do because you are lost. That's exactly right. In other words, I am in a predicament. How do I get out of this predicament? Folks, that's what saved means. It means delivered. And every time you see saved in the Bible, it doesn't necessarily mean saved, you know, from hell. It's, it's delivered. For instance, we're told that a, a woman's going to have a lot of pain in childbirth, right? But Paul said that dealing with the things about childbirth, he said to a Christian woman, he said, but if you do such and such things, you'll be delivered. You'll be saved, he says. They're going to be saved by having a baby. Is that a way to be saved from hell? They'll be delivered in the childbirth. Y'all know it was a dangerous thing to have a child not long ago. It's still dangerous, but not long ago it was really dangerous, wasn't it? And so when he's talking to this woman, what he's saying to this woman is she has come to terms with herself. She has seen what Christ did for her. She has trusted Christ. Now, who would make the better teacher? This woman or this lifelong educated Pharisee? The woman. The woman. How would she know she was to be needed saved if she didn't know she was lost? Well, that's exactly right. But what did the Pharisee think? He never been lost. He's saved because he's a Pharisee. Y'all know it's, you, you wouldn't think this, but this is the truth. There's lots of people that think they're saved because they were born into a Christian family. Yeah. They think they're saved because they've just always gone to church. Um, there are people that think they're saved because when they turned 10 or 12, their mom or dad told them it's time for you to do this, and they went and did it. They have never been in a lost condition. Who screams out, to, who, who calls on the name of the Lord? Those that are in peril. And so essentially what he's tying all this together about, remember, he's got one group of teachers over here, the Pharisees, and yet Christ is training a new group of teachers, isn't he? And he's telling this new group of teachers, you, if you're like them, you can't help anyone. These people can never help anyone because of the beam in their eye. He said, what you need to do is you need to, to strive to be like your master. Now that doesn't mean you can be equal to him. In other words, be of the same attitude. How did Christ deal with people? Loving, Loving folks. He, this was someone that dealt with them as people that needed saving, didn't he? And yet we come to talk about different ones. And he, I remember a man one time said he talked to somebody in the hospital and they got saved. And he told me, he said, I, I never regretted anything like that. And I said, what do you mean? You remember that, Lexi? He, and the guy told me, he said, I, he said, man, he said, that, that's the last person on earth I wanted to see saved, but, you know. And I thought to myself, what in the world? It's a strange comment, isn't it? Yeah. And, and essentially what he was saying, he said, yeah, but that guy's been a false teacher and a heretic all his life, and then he gets it right right there at the end. Huh? Wow. I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? Yes. I mean, look at the thief on the cross. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a crazy thing that happens here. But the idea of judging people, we've got to remember, no. We're not in the business of judging people like that. We're in the business of upholding the Word of God. And when the Word of God, if someone is brought into a judgment with the Word of God, who do we side with? The Word of God. But how do you do it? 
you do it lovingly and kindly. You do it as the person like Paul said. I'll tell you the way to help someone. I once had a uh, Steve over in Homa told me something one time. He said it was in something he was taught in, in business dealings. And it was good. I'm going to mess up how he said it. He had it put all together in a nice little phrase. But he said, if you come to someone, me and Lexi know a lady. Almost everybody hated her, seriously. If you spent 10 minutes around her, they didn't like her. And the reason they didn't like her is because within 10 minutes, she was going to tell them, well, you know what you ought to do? You know what you need to do? Y'all know folks like that? Oh, well, you know what you need to do? They're full of advice for everybody else, but if you give them advice, they get mad, right? This guy told me, he said, you know, when you're dealing with folks, that never works. He, he was in the insurance business. He said, what you do is you listen to them, and you say, okay, yeah, I see what you mean. I used to think that too, but let me tell you what happened and what changed my mind. And he had a way of, remember that, Lexi? His, I forget, he had a phrase he put it in. Oh, I see why you think that way. Yeah, I used to think that way too. Makes sense to me naturally. But somebody said this to me, and let me explain to you why I had to change my mind. That sort of thing. Folks, talk to people that way. Talk to them that way. And what you'll find is people are all, go at them this way. Let me show you where you're wrong. You're already, it's not, you're not going to, it never works. And so essentially in the Sermon on the Mount, what he's telling us is we've got to deal in love, don't we? And if we got to deal with our enemies in love, go to the lost people in love, how do we deal with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Now, anybody right now in the bottom of your pit of your stomach feeling like, yeah, this all sounds good, but it ain't possible. Come on. Come on, be honest. Okay, thank you, Courtney. Me and Courtney think alike, I know. She's right. It ain't humanly possible. I'm sorry, Maddie. It isn't humanly possible. Okay? It's not. You can't do it. You hear me? You cannot do it under your own power. But can the Holy Spirit cause you to want to do it? Now, folks, without the Holy Spirit, we can't do any of this. We can't even desire to want to do it. Now, ask yourself honestly, do you have the real desire in you to do this? If you do, it's a very good indicator that you've got someone living in you that you don't have there naturally. Because naturally, we like to get them. We like to get even. We like Y'all know what I mean. Naturally, that's our tendency, isn't it? Now, uh, back over to another thing he said here before we quit. Um, he's been dealing with the, the blind leading the blind, and he said something. <clears throat> I want you all to turn over, if you would, to Jeremiah 2. I just finished yesterday reading... Uh, just in reading through the Bible, I was in Jeremiah, and I just finished. And I'm going to tell you all, that's like reading the USA Today. Seriously, you read Jeremiah, and look what was coming on Israel, and it's like looking at the newspaper. All right, in Jeremiah 2, uh, there's, there's a charge levied against them, the people of God. It was Judah, and he says in verse 13, Jeremiah 2, 13. He says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Imagine turning from the living water to a dry well. Or in this case, to a cracked pot. You put water and it runs out the other end. If You know, there's an old John Wayne movie that's a... Every time I read these things, I think of it. It was called The Three Godfathers. Y'all ever seen that one? Great one. One of my favorites. John Wayne and these two other guys rob a bank. I know John Wayne robbed a bank. Yeah, he did. They robbed the bank and they'd run out across the desert. Ward Bond shoots at them and busts their water bag. And they wind up out in the desert. And they know they're in trouble. No water. But they know there's a well over here. You know, back then you, had, you knew where the water was, like 60 miles this way, or we're going to go 80 miles that way. So they take the 60 miles. They get almost there. They're about to die. They get right up to the point of the well, and along comes Ward Bond and his men over there, and they block the well. They made it all that distance, and guess what? No Nothing. It's the same when he's talking about these teachers. Folks, a false teacher is a well without water. How can a man who's lost lead you to a saving knowledge of Christ? He can't. I used to listen to lost men preach all the time, and I never once heard any of them say anything that even convicted me. 
I just it was just like they would read through the Bible and I really at times I didn't even know what they were talking about and I'm not saying well I'm so bright and there's still I don't mean I just mean there was no life giving words in the message why because they didn't have life themselves Hey, you know, whenever you hear someone, hey, I always give you all the example of there's these two preachers that preach when they'll have a thing. One of them's a good friend, but they come up and they preach, and one of them gets up and he's trying to sell me something. Every time he's trying to sell me, that's his approach. He's trying to, you know what I mean? And he's always hiding his punchline and working up to it. And when he finally delivers it, he's like waiting for this big man. It never happens. It just falls on its face and you listen to it. And I used to think it was just me. And I asked Lexi and she said, yeah, no, it's nothing, you know. There's nothing in it. But he speaks well, looks good, acts successful. I mean, he's got the whole package. Something's wrong. There's something terribly wrong there. The other guy gets up behind him. I can't quit laughing about the way he pronounces words. I just love it. He messes up every other word. He fouls it all up, spits all over, teeth almost fall out, and guess what? The message. The whole time he's preaching, I'm convicted, I'm moved, I know he's talking about my Savior. He's, I know who he is. He's talking about my Savior. Charles Spurgeon once went and listened to a great preacher preach. And the people said... And when he got done, he went up to the man, shook his hand, and he said, What have they done with my Savior? Y'all remember that's what Mary wanted to know about his body? Where's Christ? He's missing? Y'all see what he was asking the man? Where's the gospel? The man was, was a, a blind leading the blind. And what Christ is telling the apostles, he's about to send them out teaching, isn't he? And the Pharisees had had the job. Now, you know, the moral of the story for us is this. We better be very careful about who we follow, hadn't we? Well, how do you know? Check every word by the Scripture. Every single word. And when you find something wrong, ask. Confront. Say, hey, let me ask you. I think something. Folks, we ought to all be willing to discuss the Scriptures, shouldn't we? Yeah. And back to the, the I told you all, only once have I ever been dealt with, you know, like that. He, uh, me and Sully come from a group that, Sully, how would you describe it? Love itself, I believe. Yeah, love. Contentious. Love to be preeminent. Doctrine, you know, just love the good dig at it. When I, look, I was taught all these things about different gospels and different churches and all, and I began to see study, and this just ain't right. There's something wrong, and it coming. So when I knew it was, I started teaching what I saw was the truth. And immediately, man, the phone call started. I mean, it cuss you. It, it was just, Lexio tell you, it was rough. Well, I had to preach a lady's funeral that had asked me to preach. She said she had family that she knew didn't know the gospel and asked me would I preach the gospel. And I said, yes. And I knew at her funeral who was going to be there, that whole crowd. And it was the most uncomfortable I probably have ever been in my life. Me and Lexi went in there. And, I mean, it was just horrible. And I couldn't get out of there quick enough. But they got all, I got through it and finally got a chance to preach the gospel. We got done and I was leaving and I'm trying to just come on, let's go. And as we're getting out of there, somebody hollers my name. Hey, Troy. And I'm like, oh, man. You know, I turn around and said, yeah, I hear that you teach that there's only one church in the Bible. And so I think, well, here we go. And I said, well, yeah, that's what I see in the Scripture. He come up and shook my hand. He said, thank you. He said, I come to the same conclusion years ago. Don't you let this bunch rile you. You preach the truth as you see it in the Word. He said, now you don't ever let any of these guys swerve you off the truth. You preach the truth that God shows you and you'll be okay. Wow. Still a great friend today. Now, you know the first time I met him, what happened? He tried to correct me and we had a big argument. <laughs> what was the problem? Me. Yeah. I was the problem. Pride. Self-righteousness. You know, I was the problem. You know all he did that day? He just said, oh, my, left it. He didn't hold it against me. He didn't get back at me. He didn't sit back there and laugh and say, look, he used to be the big guy, and now look, he's, they all hate him. No. He come to me in an honest, sincere... Folks, that's how we're supposed to deal with each other. I thank God for that. I learned so much just watching this guy, how he dealt with me. It's the only one that's ever done it. I, I pray I can do it with someone, but I thank God for that, and that's how we're called to deal with each other. How? In love. You say it can't be done. Well, I watched him do it. I gave him every reason not to like me, and yet today, close friends. That's great. Only Christ can do that. Okay? All right, do y'all have any questions about that today? No? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Our Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege of being able to worship You. We thank You for giving us a day where we can turn from the things of this world and put our minds solely on Your things. Lord, we pray that today we think about Christ, we glorify Christ, we lift Him up, we meditate on the love that He has for us. Help us, Lord, be a light to the lost world. Lord, please keep us, uh, protect us from these things that are coming on us in our country that we can continue to worship in freedom. And if not, Lord, give us the strength to go through whatever You have laid out for us. But above all things, Father, please build us up and soften our hearts that the Word might mold it the way you would have it done. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay.